Bukki, Itaniku Enkiki. My Blackfoot name means singer. My government name is Grant Many Heads, and I'm one of the interpreters here at Blackfoot Crossing Historical Park. And today we're going to be talking about part two of the history of Firewater and the Siksiketsita Peaks, or the Blackfoot speaking peoples. So actually, let's uh, move back right into that. Usually, when we start off, we talk about uh, Blackfoot people themselves, the Siksiketsi, the Beaks, and those are four tribes that are that exist today, and those include the Siksika people from where I am from, and then there's our sister tribes, the Gaina and the Pikani, and the Amskapi Pikani that live in the United States of America. So when I speak of Siksiketsi, the Beaks, I'm usually speaking of these four tribes that were all Blackfoot speaking peoples. And when I speak of Nitawasan or Nitawasan or Nitawasi, I'm speaking of our land as Blackfoot people traditionally, which existed from the North Saskatchewan River, upper present day Edmonton and Rocky Mountain House to Prince Albert, all the way south to the Yellowstone where Bozeman and uh, Billings, Montana are in the state of Montana. And from the Rocky Mountains or the backbone of the world all the way east to the Touchwood Valley and uh, the Kapal Valley and Touchwood Hills. So this was a huge vast area that the Blackfoot people once considered our own. And this land was defined by the buffalo because this was prairie land and because this was plains. This is where the Ini or Inixi, the bison, the buffalo, this is where they wandered on the northern plains. So wherever the buffalo went, our people followed. And in the winter time, these animals don't migrate south. So what they would do is they would go into the river valleys or towards the foothills where they got shelter from the, the winds and from the blizzards and from the snow. And our people usually camped in these river valleys and along the foothills waiting for the buffalo to show up because we knew they would go there in the winter. And for years and for years, for practically for millennia, thousands and thousands of years, this was the normal routine for our people. We would follow their herds during the summer and in the winter we would settle down in our winter camps and we would go where the buffalo went and we would ride it out, ride out the winter along with the buffalo. And then we would do the same routine over and over. Well, this changed in the 1700s, circa 1700s, once the horse came. Because for thousands of years, our people, our only beast of burden was the dog. And so we called those the dog days before the horse came to us. And in the dog days, this was how our people lived for thousands of years, hunting the buffalo. But as I mentioned, once the horse came, that changed our lives on an incredible scale. And these horses actually came from the southern lands. They came from the Spanish when they brought them in in the 1500s. Well, right on the heels of the horse came the Napiquan and their trade goods. And even though that's Blackfoot, we never met the Napiquans right away. We received their trade goods through middlemen in trade. And those middlemen in trade were the, for the Blackfoot, were the Cinnaboyne and the Cree Indians. Those natives, they came, they met with the Hudson Bay Company traders and the Northwest Company traders, and then they brought the goods over to our Blackfoot people. And from at that time, they would give us secondhand goods and we would pay like three times the amount, uh, three times more for these secondhand goods. And this is how it went for practically a hundred years before we ever met face to face with the Northwest Company traders or the Hudson Bay Company traders. So it wasn't until about 1786 that the Blackfoot people actually started to trade regularly with, uh, with these uh, Napik ones, with these traders. And so for about a good 50 years, we traded with them. And for the longest time, the Hudson Bay Company never dealt with alcohol or never dealt with liquor. And to the Blackfoot people, we had no idea what liquor was or what intoxicants were. So when we first came across it, the only word we can come up with for liquor was napiochki. Napiochki. Kind of basically meaning white man's water. And because we thought it was water, we didn't pay for it. So at that time, the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company would use it more as a way to lure us or to entice us to trade. So they gave it away to us freely as gifts until we became dependent on it. And then it became a normal part of trade. So in this part two today, we're gonna to be talking about uh, a little bit about that, but also about the Americans, because that was a new thing when the Americans started trading with us. And, and from there, it, well, we can tell the story, but let's look at that first image. 
Okay, so the American Fur Company trade. Well, it wasn't until 1831 that the Americans finally established Fort Union. And so in Fort Union, this is where we first started trading with the American Fur Company. Because up until that time, even though they tried to trade with us as early as the 1800s, because of the Lewis and Clark expedition and the death of two Blackfoots at that time, the Blackfoot people considered the Americans enemies not like the Hudson Bay Company or the Northwest Company traders, the Northern white men who we considered friends. We looked at the American Fur Company or anybody coming from the Southwest, Southeast as enemies. So it wasn't until 1831 that we finally established trade relations with the American uh, Fur Company. And so they built Fort Union, as I mentioned, on the upper Missouri. And this is at the confluence where the Yellowstone and the Missouri rivers met. And this is where they put up this fort. And it wasn't until this time that we started trading with them. And by this time, the American Fur Company didn't hesitate in using whiskey in their trade. So if we look at the next image, the next fort that they built after Fort Union that had any sort of uh, staying power was Fort McKenzie. They built a couple of uh, posts before then, but these were burnt down basically by the Blackfoot as soon as they put them up. As soon as the traders left, we burnt them down. But then they built Fort McKenzie. And Fort McKenzie was a little farther up on the Missouri River. And from here, the Blackfoot traded with them for about a couple of uh, decades. But during this time, it was during these decades that because of the excessive distribution of liquor by the fur traders, that it started to create havoc amongst the uh, amongst our people, not just our people, but the other tribes that would go there. And so if you look at this particular image, this was um, a drawing or a painting by uh, Carl Bodmer, who came out here with Praximilian, um, Prince Maximilian Duid uh, from Germany. And they actually stayed at Fort McKenzie around 1830. And, was, and while they were staying there, this Blackfoot uh, group of uh, this band came in to trade and then they end up getting nice and gloriously drunk that night. And then they got attacked by the Assiniboine who were laying in wait. They saw them come in with all their furs for the trade. And then when they knew that the Blackfoot were pretty much uh, drunk, then in the wee hours, they attacked the Blackfoot tribes. And if it wasn't for the fact that there were Blackfoot tribes up the Missouri, camped on the other side of the river who came to their rescue, these Blackfoot would have been wiped out. So this was a... Uh, happening that happened around 1830, but more often than not, this kind of violence happened at these different trading posts. And if it wasn't uh, amongst enemy tribes that were fighting during this whiskey trade, even within the tribe, our people killed each other and our own quarrels are in feuds. So these sort of tragedies were common when the tribes came to trade at these different trading posts. So as I mentioned, this was Fort McKenzie around 1830. This was the second post, permanent post somewhat, that they built after Fort Union. If we look at the next image, you can see here at Fort McKenzie. So there was a lot of violence that happened around Fort McKenzie because of the whiskey trade. And it was no different uh, just because they were in the, in the United States side with the American forts. It was no different than the British forts. Whenever there was liquor, there always resulted in tragedies, particularly around these particular forts when the different tribes were camped there. So even in the Siksikaiti Tabiks, in our home camps, a lot of violence resulted and bloodshed because of the liquor that was going around at that time. But you know, at this time, it wasn't a major disruption to the Blackfoot people because it wasn't a disruption of our no normal daily life. Because once the whiskey was gone, then the Blackfoot would have to wait for months before they could have another taste of Napiochki. Napiochki. So it was usually once or twice a year that the tribes would come in to trade, usually in the spring and in the fall, to trade with the winter traders. And even then, the, as I mentioned, the fur traders were giving out the liquor as gifts. So they weren't really selling it. They would sell small amounts of it, but for the most part, it was as gifts. And they, would, and they would purposely get the tribes drunk. And then on the next day after they sobered up, then they would trade with them. So usually during these drunken bouts, that's when the violence occurred. But this would happen, like I mentioned, maybe once or twice a year. And it wasn't normal because once they finished trading, 
then they would go back to their normal lives and whiskey would play no part in it and people uh, would be okay. There wouldn't be any violence as, or I guess as much violence as there would usually be. But there wasn't violence caused by liquor simply because we didn't have it for most of those months unless we went to the trading posts. So this particular scene we're looking at here is when the traders opened fire on the Blackfoot when they came to trade. This is because uh, a week earlier there was some Blackfoot who attacked this particular fort and killed one of their men and drove off a lot of their horses. And there was a few deaths that resulted so that the next visiting party who are unaware of what happened the week before came to trade and then the traders opened fire on them. And at this time, there was about 13 or 14 Blackfoot who were killed. And this was part of our winter count. So in the winter count records, this um, event actually was recorded. So if we move on to the next image, here's the, we can see the proliferation of the different forts. In the north at the top of the page there, you can see where all the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company forts were located. And this was all just at the edge of Blackfoot territory. So if you look at the north part there, they were far enough north that their daily trading habits never affected us, never really affected the Blackfoot uh, peoples in our own lands. So you can see all the Hudson Bay Company and Northwest Company forts in the north part there. And in the south, you can see Fort Union uh, kind of far to the bottom of the page there on the right hand side. And then towards the left hand side there, you can see Fort McKenzie. So this is how far that they moved from Fort Union up river to uh, the middle of the Blackfoot lands, particularly in the south there. So these were the two, these were all the trading posts around 1840, 1850. Now, if we look at the next image, here's the American Fur Company trade route. Now the trade, the capital of the fur trade in the United States of America was in St. Louis. And so they actually had to travel up the Missouri all the way to like Fort Vermilion, then Fort Lookout, Fort Pierre. And then you get to Fort Berthold up where the Mandan, Hadats, and the Rikara natives were. And then you move up on the Missouri and you get to Fort Beaufort. And then there's Fort Union. Now Fort Union, as I mentioned, this was the first American Fur Company trade post that we actually started trading with the Americans. And then they moved up to Fort McKenzie and then eventually to Fort Benton. And Fort Benton remained the capital of the uh, fur trade from the time that it was, uh, came into existence. So although whiskey wasn't sold by the AFC and it was not its main stock in trade, like the Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company, the American Fur Company gave it as gifts to bring in the customers. They used it to entice the customers to come in, particularly the Six Gates, the Beaks, the Blackfoot tribes, but they sold it in limited quantities. So when these companies were in business, there was a lot of liquor trade, but it was limited. It was controlled to a certain point. But the thing is the Americans offered more trade items and it was, they were a lot cheaper and they offered more whiskey. So more often than not, the Blackfoot tribes start to gravitate to the American fur company when it came to trading uh, furs for uh, trade goods because they were cheaper than going to the British. And there was a reason for that because the British had to use canoes and they used the North Saskatchewan to bring up their goods and to transport their goods down the river. So the whole time that they're transporting up and down the river, they're using canoes. But on the Missouri, because it was a wider river, they started to use uh, steamboats. And eventually they made their way out to Fort Benton with the steamboats. So they're able to carry a lot more goods up river and carry a lot more goods down river. So that was one of the reasons why the American Fur Company was able to get away with selling cheaper items. Now, if we look at the next image, we can see here with the Hudson Bay Company and the AFC rivalry that given this new competition, the Hudson Bay Company had no alternative but to continue to supply liquor or so at least that was their excuse. Because there were, uh, by this time, the British government had already tried to limit or ban uh, using liquor in the trade with the natives. And the American government as early as 1832, a year after we opened trade relations with the Americans in 1831, were already trying to uh, limit and ban the use of liquor in the native trade. But both these companies used their competition, this rivalry, as an excuse to continue using liquor 
when they were trading with the native tribes. So although they were used primarily as gifts to cement trade relations, rum and brandy still was a big part of the British Blackfoot trade. So the AFC, the American Fur Company, because they were made up of former Hudson Bay Company and Northwest Company traders, they adopted the British trade system. And this was a little bit more successful for them than their previous methods uh, to compete with the Hudson Bay Company. And it was way more successful for them, this adoption of the, uh, the Northwest Company and Hudson Bay Company way of trading with the native tribes. So if we look at this next uh, image, Okay, well, let's look at this time. The effects of the liquor trade on the Siksikaitse at the peaks. Well, as I've written out there, the disastrous effects of the liquor on the Blackfoot while they were at the trading posts and upon their return to camps cannot be questioned. As we um, talked about earlier, there was a lot of violence and a lot of debauches and lots of uh, tragedies that happened whenever the Blackfoot tribes visited these trading posts. It didn't matter whether they were British, French, or if they were uh, American. So during this time, for decades, like from the 18, 1780s up until about 1830s, well, during these decades of excessive distribution by the fur traders of liquor and then using them as gifts, this liquor created havoc amongst the tribes because people killed each other in quarrels or in uh, disputes. And there were serious feuds that happened because of this. And the only reason why it wasn't more serious was because the Blackfoot only went to these trading posts as I mentioned, once or twice a year. So these tragedies would happen only once or twice a year. And even in the, uh, the Blackfoot people's winter counts, a lot of these effects weren't uh, recorded because they were rare. They would only happen maybe once throughout the year, something bad would happen. And even then it wasn't so bad that it wasn't recorded as the most uh, serious dispute or a serious event of that year. So things could have been worse, but the fact that we only visited the trading posts in the spring or in the summer, usually after these times, the, our tribes got back to normal daily life. They would go out and hunt the buffalo like they did for millennia, for hundreds of years before. They would go out, hunt the buffalo, uh, go to their, collect their pemmican, make their pouches, just basically do what they always did. And the only time things got disrupted is whenever they went to these trading posts. So if we look at, look at the next uh, image, this changed. So there are some great changes. Come the 1850s, there was great changes in the economics and the politics and the settlement of the upper Missouri region. And this was, as you saw on the map, this was when they moved from Fort Union going up to Fort McKenzie and eventually to Fort Benton. And when they moved up river on the Missouri, this had a huge impact on the Blackfoot speaking peoples. And you can see here, here's a picture of Fort Benton in its early days. In 1846, it was set up as a stockade, as a post, and then eventually it became the post and the center of trade for the Blackfoot people. And you can see there before the steamboats, they'd have different types of barges and river craft that would bring up trade goods to uh, Fort Benton. Uh, boats and barges that were bigger than the canoes that the Hudson Bay Company, the Northwest Company used to transport their goods. So if we look at the next image, here we have Fort Benton. So on Christmas Day in 1850, the American Fur Company trader, Alexander Culbertson, he stood before this new adobe, adobe building. And then it was then that he officially proclaimed this place Fort Benton, gave it, gave, gave it its new name, Fort Benton. So this Fort Benton was the only white settlement in what 14 years later, Abraham Lincoln would proclaim the Montana Territory. So this was the first place that the settlers started to gravitate to after 1850. And the interesting note is Alexander Culbertson, the reason why he was so successful in enticing a lot of the Blackfoot to trade was because of his wife. Um, her name was, I'm not even sure if it's properly uh, pronunciated, but it was not the Wista. Or she was um, basically chief seen from afar, blood chief seen from afar, sister. And their father was Chief Two Bears. And so this was his wife. And she was instrumental in bringing a lot of the Blackfoot trade to this new post to Fort Benton. And at this time, Fort Benton was controlled by the American Fur Company. Now, if we look at the next image, 
things changed. In the 1850s, we had the Lame Bull Treaty. So in 1855, Isaac I. Stevens, who was a newly appointed governor of the Washington Territory, he finally managed to get a huge council and brought the Blackfoot into direct negotiations with the American government at that time. So it was during this time that we actually had the first treaty with the Americans. And this treaty became known as the Lame Bull Treaty. And this was signed on the 17th of October in 1855. And within this treaty, there, this document, it would ultimately would affect the Blackfoot people's lives, particularly when it came to the sale of liquor. You move to the next image. So the most important of this provisions of this Lame Bull Treaty were Articles 4 and 5, which described uh, our hunting grounds. And it basically designated what was considered Blackfoot hunting grounds. And they gave us a huge reservation, which basically was most of Montana, a huge part of the Montana, ter Montana Territory east of the Rocky Mountains and north of the Missouri River. Well, under this federal le legislation, in 1834, there was a law that reservations were automatic automatically designated Indian Territory. So the sale of liquor, or even bringing liquor onto a reservation, it was illegal. And the funny thing about Fort Benton is this capital of the whiskey trade, it was situated on Blackfoot land. But this was something that the federal officials, even when they moved into Fort Benton, they disregarded. They never really took that into effect. But Fort Benton was situated on Blackfoot land, so there should have been no liquor at all. Uh, no selling of it or any liquor on this part of uh, the Blackfoot territory which it was situated on. And this was because of the Lame Bull Treaty. Now this was in 1855 and soon after the signing of this Lame Bull Treaty, well then the gold rush happened. So if we look at this next image, in 1856, there was a huge gold rush and the discovery of gold in basically Blackfoot lands brought over hundreds and hundreds of prospectors to the Blackfoot area to our territory. But so unlike the fur traders, these men had no business to conduct with us, with the six gates eat the beaks. And in fact, they considered the Blackfoot tribes pests who stole their horses and interfered with their prospecting and bothered them in their camps. And these prospectors, they didn't hesitate to trespass upon our lands in their uh, thirst for gold, their gold prospecting. And so this basically, in, resulted in confrontations. And in these confrontations, a lot of deaths occurred on both sides. A lot of Blackfoot were killed by these prospectors, and a lot of the prospectors were killed by the Blackfoot warriors who would come across them. So this existed from about 1850 right up until 1860, and then things gradually got worse. So if we look at the next image, here we see Fort Benton again, and now we can see steamships. So in 1862, the first steamboat to arrive made Fort Benton the farthest inland post, actually 3,485 miles from the Gulf of Mexico. So from the Gulf of Mexico, one of these steamships could travel all the way up the Mississippi, Missouri River, right up into the Blackfoot lands, right before the Great Falls. And then once they got to the Great Falls, they couldn't go any further uh, west. So Fort Benton became the stopping point for these steamboats. And as I mentioned earlier, these steamboats could carry a whole lot more goods and people upriver and a whole lot of goods downriver, particularly uh, furs, buffalo furs and uh, small fur-bearing mammals, their furs. So during this time, there was towns such as Virginia City and Helena. These towns sprung up and there were saloons were opened and these saloons were open to serve the thirsty miners, all the gold prospectors and those people looking for gold in the Blackfoot lands. So the liquor they sold at these saloons came up the Missouri River by the steamboats. And also Fort Benton had warehouses. So these, uh, this liquor was held in warehouses in Fort Benton until they could be hauled overland by bull trains and wagons to places such as Virginia City and Helena. So Fort Benton basically became the stopping point and the center of trade. And, and the reason for it was because of the steamboats and because of the warehouses. So all the liquor storage depots were in Fort Benton. So this was a woeful combination, particularly for the Blackfoot people, because 
As I mentioned, Fort Benton was located on Blackfoot lands, and this city was being reached by the steamboat traffic, and it was holding all the liquor for the entire region where the settlers and prospectors were settling in uh, Montana at that time. So by 1862, there was a lot of traffic, a lot of people, literally almost 4 million people who were crossing back and forth from the east part of the United States to the western parts along the coast in places like Oregon and Washington. So by 1862, there was a lot of traffic going through and all of this spelled disaster for the Blackfoot people. So if we look at the next um, image, So what ended up happening is by 1865, the American Fur Company started to sell their forts. Why was this significant? Well, this was because like the Hudson Bay Company and like uh, the Northwest Company, the, the AFC or the American Fur Company, they provided a measure of stability when it came to, because they only, they provided some stability to the region, I should say, because they only distributed enough liquor to meet its competition. And as I mentioned, a lot of this liquor was given out as gifts to the peoples to entice trade, but they didn't sell huge amounts of liquor to the people because they didn't want things to get out of control. So by the late 1860s, this influence was gone. The old established traders that the, who the Blackfoot were used to trading with, they were gone. So we were left to the mercy of uh, small time traders. And these people, they cared nothing for stability they wanted to make as much profit as they possibly can, especially with the whiskey trade. So they wanted to make as much, much profits as they could and then to get out of the area. And this is what they basically did. So when they started to sell these forts, that started to spell a uh, disaster for the Blackfoot people. Look at the next image. So what ends up happening when these people left, the free traders came in. So these were usually, as I mentioned, uh, small time traders and opportunists. In fact, a lot of these people were Civil War veterans, uh, people from the American Civil War, 1860, ended around 1864, 1865. So a lot of these veterans of the Civil War wanting to make a quick buck and a quick fortune would come up into Fort Benton with a wagon full of whiskey and they would go out and sell this whiskey to the natives to make as much money as they could. And the thing is, even though we don't show it here, the ratio of his trade was like a 35 cent cup of whiskey was equal to a buffalo robe. And this buffalo robe they could sell in St. Louis for $16. So you gotta kind of do the math there. 35 cents worth of liquor for $16, for a $16 robe. This is the kind of money that they made. So if they came out with a, uh, with a couple of barrels of whiskey, they could leave with a lot of furs and those furs would end up becoming uh, a huge amount of money for them. So some people said there was even like 400% profit, whatever that would amount to. But these were opportunists. So they only came in, sold their liquor, and then they left. And sometimes this liquor wasn't even liquor, really. It was alcohol adulterated with a whole bunch of other things, such as uh, either it was watered down or sometimes they added turpentine. They added things that were poisonous to this liquor, to give it bite and scratch, as they put it. And so a lot of this liquor wasn't even really liquor. And this is where the term fire water came from, because a lot of this would be mixed with tobacco, would be mixed with Hostetter's bitters, Jamaican ginger. Um, alcoholic uh, beverages are concoctions that were used for other reasons, but they would use this in the liquor and sell this to the natives. And a lot of the native peoples would drink this and get sick, but they came to call it fire water because of how it tasted and what it was made out of. So a lot of opportunists, opportunists came and they took advantage of this trade, especially once the American Fur Company was gone and sold their, sold their uh, forts. So like it says there, unlike the large companies, these traders made no attempt to restrict the scale of their business and they often dealt with whiskey as their main stock in trade. So they wouldn't come out with goods, they'd come out with minimal goods, uh, maybe a, a few blankets or a few trinkets and such. But for the most part, they came out with fire water, with whiskey, and this is what they wanted to sell to the native peoples. They didn't care to sell food or dry goods or uh, even trade goods or trade items. They came out with just their adulterated whiskey. So this also spelled a formula for disaster for the Blackfoot people. Now, if we move on to the next image, 
Then we come to this man, the whiskey merchants in Fort Benton. So Isaac G. Baker, as you can see his story right there, he arrived in Fort Benton in 1864. And he was the last American Fur Company chief trader. So he was working with the American Fur Company before they sold their fort. And after they sold their fort, he left the fur trade behind. And then he invested in his own inventory of goods in the spring of 1866. And then he opened his first significant general store, as we can see here, the IG Baker and Company store in the town's Main Street. And this is in Fort Benton. And what he did is he wholesaled goods and whiskey to independent wagon owners. And these were the wagon owners who went out to the Blackfoot camps and bartered goods with the Blackfoot and with the Crow Indians in the area there as well. And so these wagon traders were basically working out the back of their wagons. And some of them were, sell were selling trade items, but for the most part, they were selling whiskey and he was their main supplier. Now, if we look at the next image, there's another man this man, his name was Tom Power. So within a year after Baker had his first output amongst the Bikani on the Marias River, and about the same time he welcomed to town this man, Tom Power. And this person became his chief competition. Well, these guys were in friendly competition with one another. And Tom Power, he adopted his own way of conducting business. But both of them, they agreed that the frontier was big enough for both of them. And as I mentioned, they were friendly rivals. And sometimes they would put their money together and things like um, buying steamboats to get steamboats to come up with goods. So they would share costs and a lot of things. They would lend money to one another. But these were the main whiskey merchants in Fort Benton. In fact, uh, you could almost lay the problems of the Blackfoot at that time on these two men in particular, because nobody else was bringing up liquor to the Fort Benton region except these two people. And it, they became millionaires out of this. They uh, not only sold to the Blackfoot, but they also sold to those people we talked about in Virginia City and Helena to the different saloon keepers. So they were bringing up um, all of this liquor and storing them in the warehouses that were located in Fort Benton. Now, if we look at the next image, we see that both of them. So with these two men, once they arrived in town, whiskey took on a new importance as a commodity. So these two merchants basically dominated Fort Benton and became the primary suppliers for the whiskey trade. And they also controlled the Indian trade during, uh, for a decade or so before, uh, before 1870, even actually after 1870, up until the time of the Mounties uh, arrival in, the, in Canada, in the British possessions in Blackfoot country. So these guys, basically they brought uh, Montana's economy they were responsible for uh, its boom, for the Montana economy's boom. But it was also the most, they're bringing in the whiskey, as I mentioned, this was the most destructive force imaginable to the Blackfoot, to the six gates at the peaks. So this competition between these two men, is, it actually resulted in the outpost trade. And what the outpost trade was basically, was uh, people putting up trading posts Further and further into Blackfoot country on the different rivers, they moved from the Missouri River onto the Marias River, onto the Musselshell River, up to the Sun River, to the Teton River, all the way up to the, the Milk River, and eventually, like after 1870, up into the British possessions, up into present-day southern Alberta. But they started the outpost trade, and because of this competition with one another, they were wanting to outdo the other or outsell the other, and they were using whiskey as their main stock and trade. And like I mentioned, it wasn't always a good whiskey because a lot of these people they sold the whiskey to would adulterate it with other goods. They would water it down. They would add more elements to it just to make more money, just so they had more liquid to pass off as, as liquor. And they would sell these fire water to the native tribes uh, that were in that area. And most of, most times that was the six gates at the peaks, the Blackfoot that they sold to. And they also did this because there was a marshal and there was a law against them selling liquor, but those uh, law elements like the marshal or the Indian agents, they were in the town of Fort Benton and in that area. And usually they didn't go out to the outposts. And sometimes they didn't even know where the outposts were that were located in on the different rivers near the Blackfoot camps. So they're able to get away with trafficking in this illegal uh, liquor trade. So if we look at the next image, <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Well, this resulted in uh, what they called the Blackfoot War. So Montana's, Montana Territory's rough frontier mining population combined with the whiskey trading, horse raiding, and then the Blackfoot being dispossessed of our hunting grounds, basically all the areas that we hunted south of the Yellowstone, I mean, sorry, south of the Mari uh, Missouri River, south of Fort Benton, this land became filled with settlers and prospectors. And so we lost a lot of this land. It used to be Blackfoot uh, territory because of the amount of settlers that were now in that region. So we were dispossessed of our hunting grounds. And because of this, what, what ended up happening in 1865, this erupted, exploded in a series of incidents where there was a lot of bloodshed on each side, uh, on the Blackfoot side and on the settlers in Montana. There was a lot of violence that happened. There was a lot of people who were killed. A lot of uh, Blackfoot who would visit the town of Fort Benton would be basically lynched. There was actually four people that were killed. An uh, old man brought out in the middle of town and killed in front of other people because of uh, retaliation back and forth between the Blackfoot tribes and the Fort Benton settlers. There would be so much violence that it was like kit for tat. People were killing one another be based on the event that happened last week or last month. And so this continued right up until 1869, and but it started about 1865. And so by this time, the local people were calling it a Blackfoot War. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of confrontations that led to hostility and anger and bloodshed and ruthlessness on both parts of the Siksigaitik, the Beaks, and the settlers in the Fort Benton area. And because of this, the newspapers in Fort Benton would start to always put out uh, headlines, basically blaming all the bad things that were happening on the Blackfoot people. So there was a lot of animosity that was uh, created because of this towards the Blackfoot people. And so it came down to the point where they would open fire on each other just on first sight. The Bentonites, uh, these settlers would see the Blackfoot coming in and they would open fire. And the Blackfoot, when they saw these traders or these people coming into our lands, we would open fire on them. And so there was a lot of bad blood that was created because of this. And people would say that this was because of the horse raiding and because of this stuff. But no, even the Indian agent at that time blamed all of this on the whiskey trade, particularly the whiskey trade with the native tribes. So they put the blame on the whiskey traders because these whiskey traders are unscrupulous. They didn't care that they were ruining lives. All they wanted to do was make a profit. So we look at the next image. So with this Blackfoot War, as I mentioned, many of the problems in the Blackfoot War resulted from the trafficking in the whiskey in and around Fort Benton. And that was because the whiskey traders usually bought small amounts of liquor and either from the saloons or from one of the trading companies, they sold it to the Indians. And because of the violence, they would go out at night and meet some of the certain uh, native peoples there. And then they would sell liquor to them at nightfall. And then these people would take that liquor back to camp, either in bottles or in kegs and then they would drink and then they would just continue this, this uh, vicious process, vicious cycle over and over, as I mentioned, for about four years from 65, 1865 to about 1869. So if we look at the next image, now we have the free traders. So for the Blackfoot people, the Siksigaitse to be, the 1860s, it set the stage for the unbridled flooding of our camps with whiskey. So this created misery and chaos, and it thrust our people into the roles of outcasts, as I mentioned, in a land that we once controlled and identified as our own. So more and more, the settlers are moving into Montana, especially in the southern parts, south of Fort Benton, and more and more, the Blackfoot people are being pushed north of the Missouri River. And then even then, these free traders, these people would bring liquor into the Blackfoot camps, and then they would sell their wares there. And very rarely did they come in with trade items or trade goods like pots and pans and, and blankets and clothing and things of such. They would come in with whiskey. And a lot of it was adulterated whiskey. So this started to happen in the 1860s. And this changed the way our people, uh, our behavior when it came to, to liquor and alcohol. So if we look at the next image, We see that by 1867, that this trade extended to a number of points along the Missouri River. So not just in Fort Benton, but there was posts all along the outposts, all along the Missouri River, up and down. 
that there were uh, free traders putting up their small little posts to trade with the native tribes. And this was fed because of the increasing presence of steamboat traffic. Whereas in 1862, maybe one or two steamboats were actually coming up the Missouri all the way to Fort Benton. By 1867, there was 40, maybe 50 trips steamboats would be making all year round, going up and down the Missouri River and bringing goods and taking goods down from Fort Benton to St. Louis. So if we look at the next image, by the spring of 1868, there was a new rush of homesteaders. So there was more and more settlers and homesteaders and uh, prospectors who were coming into the Montana Territory through Fort Benton because of the steamboat traffic. And at this same time, those two main traders that we talked about earlier, uh, Baker and Power, they had a, there was a number of smaller outfits with whiskey at the ready, and they were all trading on the Marias River. So they moved from the Missouri River up to the Marias River, and this trade started to invade the Blackfoot lands as more and more whiskey traders were taking their wares and their goods and their illegal whiskey into the nor uh, north, into the Blackfoot territory, into Nittawasi. So let's look at the next image. And here's an interesting note. You know, Mountain Chief, who was one of the predominant Bikani chiefs at that time, and these, uh, these problems were affecting him and his people at that time because they were the closest to Fort Benton. Well, much to these traders' surprise, this Bikani chief, Mountain Chief, he basically ran them off of their land. They all went up there and then they were all plying their trade and then he drove them out. He told them that he sent them packing, Isaac Baker and Tom Power and all these different uh, traders. He didn't kill them. He basically told them, you have to leave. I don't want you on Blackfoot land. I don't want you on my territory. And so he, he basically forced these people to go back to Fort Benton. And he didn't want them to come back onto their territory. In fact, earlier that summer, he went to Fort Benton, but he was roughed up and he was driven out of town after he spoke to Malcolm Clark, who was the Indian agent the Indian commissioner at that time. Once the Bentonites knew that he was in town and that he didn't want uh, the traders coming onto his lands, they roughed him up, as I mentioned, and they drove him out of town. But still, he was nice about it that when they came onto his lands, he told them, you people can't be here. Well, I don't want you here. And it wasn't just him. It was a lot of the other Blackfoot leaders at that time who didn't want these traders coming onto Blackfoot lands. What they wanted was to trade the same way they did in the years past. Was And basically what he said too, because he didn't want the fire water coming amongst his people, he visited the fort and he explained to the federal officials there that his tribe would bring robes to the fort, Fort Benton, if they wished to trade. And as he said, we want the new traders to act like the old men who traded long ago, he said. And then he said, we do not wish these pale faces to come to our villages. There is nothing in common between us. So at that time, the Blackfoot leadership, they didn't want the whiskey traders coming into Blackfoot land because they knew that they were causing new problems. As I mentioned before, they were used to the once or, or the twice yearly visits to the whiskey posts, but now that was changing. Now these whiskey traders were coming to the Blackfoot lands and this was the start of it. They were coming to the Blackfoot camps and they were wanting to sell their whiskey. And so even then, as far as 1868, Chief Mountain Chief and a lot of other Blackfoot chiefs at that time did not want these whiskey traders coming onto Blackfoot lands and they made efforts to drive them out. But because of the amount of settlers and whiskey traders coming into Fort Benton, uh, they were unable to stop that. And what resulted was a lot more violence between the Siksikaiti Tepiks and these uh, American settlers that were moving into the Upper Missouri, um, upper, upper Missouri region. So if we look at the next image, what the government tried to do was they tried to uh, initiate licensed trading posts because they knew that there was a lot of people going into Blackfoot lands, making money, uh, selling these wares. They didn't want this happening anymore. And they weren't really listening to Mountain Chief. In fact, they rejected Mountain Chief's plea to restrict all these white men uh, from trespassing on the reservation, on the Blackfoot reservation. So what the federal agent did instead was he licensed two traders to set up posts on the Teton and the Marias rivers. And so to gain some control over the trading situation, the federal government decided late in 1868 to permit two firms. It was I.G. Baker 
and it was uh, the Northwest Fur Company, and they allowed these two trading posts on the Blackfoot Reservation, beginning in the 1868-69 season. So the government believed that by placing licenses in the hands of these two traders that were subject to cancellation if they were found selling liquor to the Blackfoot, that this would encourage the Blackfoot to trade with, uh, trade with them. So they figured that these companies would have permanent posts with large stock of goods, not in, no, no liquor, and, and, and that was because they did want to get rid of the, the traders who worked off the back of their wagons that were doing that trade before then. So they figured that this would control the whiskey trade in uh, the Blackfoot lands. They figured that these licensed traders would be more likely to report any illegal traders that were selling liquor um, and cutting into their business on Blackfoot lands. While this was wishful thinking, this never happened. But it did set up these posts here, as you can see here, where the Blackfoot could go to one of these two posts where they could buy uh, trade goods, not liquor, but trade goods, pots, pans, uh, axes, items as such, blankets and these sort of things, clothing, shirts. And this and the Blackfoot did go to a lot of these places. But these traders from the licensed trading posts, they realized that they were losing money because this didn't stop the unlicensed traders from going into the Blackfoot lands. So if we look at the next image, here we see the unlicensed whiskey traders. So once the license was given to IG Baker on the post on the Marias River and the other to the Northwest Fur Company uh, for a post to be operated by John Ripplinger on the Teton River, well, although the trade was good, the government hopes that the uh, posts would discourage whiskey traders, this proved groundless. It never happened. Because as soon as the posts were located so that the people knew where these, these uh, permanent posts were, well, then the whiskey traders from Sun River and from Fort Benton and every place else, they began to congregate around these permanent posts and they would camp within a mile or two of these permanent posts and then they would sell whiskey to the Siksikaiti Tipeaks. The Blackfoot that went to these posts to trade, they would be met by these uh, traders, these people who were kind of hiding in the woods and they would be waiting for the first Blackfoot heading that way to these posts and then they would cut them off, intercept them, and they would sell liquor to these... Uh, natives that are going into these legal posts to trade. So we look at the next image. So the one trader there with the Northwest Company, John Ripplinger, he completed his post on the Teton River. And like the Baker post on the Marias River, he remained entirely free of liquor in order to maintain his trading license. But he realized that he found it difficult to compete with the whiskey sellers. Because as I mentioned, these whiskey sellers basically went into the Blackfoot camps. They were no longer just cutting off people going to their posts. Now these whiskey traders are actually going right into the Blackfoot camps with their liquor. And they were selling this uh, liquor to the Blackfoot people right in their camps uh, for as many robes as they could, they could get with their liquor. And so these unlicensed whiskey traders... There wasn't just a, a couple or a dozen. There was literally hundreds that would flood the entire Blackfoot lands in those areas. And so even though the Northwest Company, Northwest Fur Company and, and the Baker, IG Baker Post, were making some money off their trade goods, a lot of times they were threatened with violence because they didn't have liquor. The natives would go to them expecting to get liquor. And since they wouldn't have it, the natives would tell them to get off their land, that they were using up wood, that they were uh, using land that they shouldn't even be there. So it, it never created any peace and it never created any good way of trading. It, it just basically caused chaos, especially amongst the Blackfoot uh, tribes that were near there. So if we look at the next image, you can see here, as I mentioned, John Ripplinger of the Northwest Fur Company and Isaac Baker, his delegate, William Conrad, they became the first-hand witnesses to the chaotic winter that, that year when they were stationed at their outposts. As I mentioned, Ripplinger complained that the whiskey traders constantly intercepted Blackfoot tribesmen headed their way, and they filled them with rot gut. That's what they called it, rot gut whiskey. This wasn't even good whiskey. This was all adulterated whiskey. And every whiskey trader had their own recipe. In a lot of these different recipes of whiskey, they added uh, copper, uh, blue button, which was um, poisonous. And they would put in uh, 
chewing tobacco or just regular tobacco or they would use bitters, Hostetter bitters, Jamaican rum, Jamaican ginger, all different types of items to put in there to give it bite and scratch to make it why they call it fire water and also because in some cases they would use laudanum which is a opium, opiate and they would use this to get the um, use more of that and less of the alcohol to get the people drunk are basically a high or stoned off of this um, concoction so that they would pass out before they could even really finish their drinks. So a lot of these uh, traders are going into the Blackfoot camps selling what they could but for the most part they were selling rot gut whiskey and a lot of this rot gut whiskey would kill the people who were drinking it on their first drink. They would drink a keg of this stuff and by morning they were dead. So this happened in a lot of cases. And this started in the United States of America, near Fort Benton, this sort of trade. And so as we can tell, this was totally uncontrolled. And so there were efforts by the American government to put a stop to this. Because as I mentioned, in 1834 and 1832, well, in 1832, the British tried to put a stop or tried to limit the trade of alcohol when it came to trading with the natives. And in 1834, the, the Americans actually had a law that was trying to limit the amount of alcohol used in trade with the natives. But these laws were totally overlooked by these traders. And all these traders were interested in was making a profit, making money. And because there was uh, very little law enforcement in America, a lot of these traders got away with it, got away with selling uh, poisonous whiskey to the native tribes. So if we look at the next image, we kind of look at the effects of the liquor trade on the Siksikaiti Tepiks. So, as we talked about earlier, you know, intoxicants are not piochki. Intoxicants of any kind had been unknown to the Blackfoot prior to European contact. So, although rum or whiskey had been around since the 1770s, the tribes had only limited access to this rum and this whiskey. And, and this, we got to remember, is the British and the Northwest Company rivalry. This was their trade. This was before the Americans got involved. And so the British and the Northwest Companies, they basically used real whiskey, high wines. But when it got to the Blackfoot, they watered it down. They didn't add anything to it. They just watered it down and they sold this to the Blackfoot tribes. So for the most part, the Blackfoot were drinking uh, high wines, rum, brandy and such. And we only had access to it once or twice a year. So usually during this once or twice a year, when we, when our Blackfoot people would go to these uh, trading posts to drink, they had a big drunk, a big debauch for one or two days. And this whiskey they didn't pay for. This was given out as gifts. And then they would drink it with a lot of gusto, just like when they were celebrating a victory over an enemy or when they were performing a ritual, we'd go all out. And then after, they would return to their camps and then they remained sober for the next several months until the next trip to the fort. And this was how the routine was established. So this pattern it was well established over the years up until 1831 with the American Fur Company trade. And even then, it was still like that. We only visited the Americans maybe once or twice a year. And it wasn't until 1850 that this started to change, particularly with Fort Benton coming into existence. So for before 1850, the Blackfoot people only drank once or twice a year. And so that was the routine, that was the pattern. But once the whiskey traders start to come into our camps, while this changed, now we're encouraged as uh, Blackfoot people to extend that drinking year round. Now you could do it basically every day. And in fact, by time it got to the Marias River and up north past Fort Benton, there were some tribes, some bands Basically, this is what they did, is they drank every day. And during the winter months, it was every day that they were drinking. And so a lot of people were dying from the effects of this liquor trade on the Six Gates at the Peaks. So if we actually look at the next image. And as it's written here, like many older men, they showed restraint during this difficult period because they were used to drinking twice yearly like they used to do with the fur trading posts. So the worst offenders during this time, after 1850, the worst offenders were the young adults and the middle-aged men. So they plunged into this strange new world with no concern for the future. 
and no memory of the past. Sort of sounds like today, you know, like our people never learned from this time because during the residential school period, the residential school teachers weren't teaching our people about our history, about our past. So come 1865 with uh, 60 scoop, as they talk about it, 1965, our people didn't learn from the effects of the liquor on our people from the past. So just like then, these young people, they had no memory and no concern for the future. So they lived for the moment, as many people do today. And when the alcohol carried them into a delirium of intoxication, they became self-destructive in their way of life. And this was a way they had never known before. They would just continue to drink. They would buy this liquor, this poisonous liquor, and they would just drink. And they had no, no uh, regard for uh, the people around them. As I point out uh, at the third point there, these people, their aggressions, at one time, those aggressions were directed towards enemy tribes. But now it was in, pointed inwards towards their own people. So a lot of violence occurred during this time. You know, there were, people were easily offended or they often reacted to an innocent comment or action with uh, so much violence that death or permanent injury resulted. And this did, didn't just happen amongst the older people. I mean, this happened amongst our young people and amongst uh, our chiefs even. You know, sometimes they would uh, be insulted and then instead of uh, letting things go or talking to the person, they would open fire or stab somebody or next thing you know, somebody would be dead. So at that's, this time, our people, they drank and they argued and they fought and they killed one another. So this is when the whiskey became bad. And if you think about it today, you know, with a lot of um, the drinking and with a lot of the addictions, a lot of our people could learn from this era. And the thing is, even around this time, this is when the winter counts start to record some of these events. Now, if you don't know what the winter counts are, these were robes that had events recorded on them. And then these events usually had one big event of the year to go by. Well, before 1865, most of the events were big events that had nothing to do with alcohol. But after 1865, most of the events up until the time of the Northwest Mounted Police arrival on the Canadian Plains, most of the events had to do with alcohol. And things were happening for the first time that never happened before. Things like domestic violence, people killing and beating their wives. Our people didn't do these things before. It was very rare. But once the alcohol became a big problem for the natives, especially the Blackfoot people, then we start to see these recorded in the winter counts. Then you start to see people dying from uh, innocent argument. Friends who were friends for years would share a keg for the first time. And then by the end of the night, somebody's dead. And then the next time this person's drinking, not because he wants to drink and have fun, but because he's drowning his sorrows. So this sort of vicious cycle started to take place amongst our native tribes, even as early as 1865. And a lot of this was recorded in the winter counts. But we'll get into those winter counts when we get into the part three of this um, uh, history of firewater and the Blackfoot people. So during this time, the liquor, the effects of the liquor trade on the Blackfoot peoples, this is when they got worse. Instead of the once, twice yearly visits to the Whiskey Post and where random violence may have occurred there and li daily life wasn't disrupted, now we're finding daily life disrupted on a daily basis because now the whiskey traders were coming into the Blackfoot camps regularly and then the people weren't given a break and they would continue drinking. And, and uh, if we look at the next image, not everybody drank. So, and in fact, not all families were cursed by the craving for whiskey. But even for those, those chiefs who were able to control a lot of their people, they faced problems because it only took a few people, a few rowdies to trigger chaos. You could have a peaceful camp and you have two or three people that come in with the liquor and the next thing you know, somebody's dead. And then there's families wanting vengeance on account of what happened. So liquor, even a small amount of it in those camps where there wasn't much drinking, it caused problems. There was a lot of problems that were caused because of the craving for liquor. So even those chiefs that didn't want it, at least at this time, they could move south. I mean, sorry, north into the British possessions, as they called it, up into our northern territories, the northern part of Nitawasi. And that's what a lot of Siksika and a lot of blood, uh, gain, gain away, gain, uh, blood camps, a lot of them moved north to get away from the whiskey trade. So these drunken quarrels and these savage fights, they would break out in the camps. And as I mentioned, a lot of them often ended up in death. And other times the whole camps erupted into drunken orgies of violence with friends and brothers turning on one another. 
So with this, this upheaval, as it was in Montana Territory, a lot of the Siksika, the Gaina and Bikani, a lot of them were staying north of the border to get away from this whiskey trade. And only those people that were craving for the whiskey are kind of given to it. Those people would stay south of the border near, the, near Fort Benton, where they can get into the whiskey trade. In fact, around this time, even our chief Crowfoot and his band, the Biters, and then after that, the Moccasin Band, they tried to stay as far away as they could from the whiskey trade, uh, staying in places such as the Hand Hills while this was happening, far, hundreds of miles away from the whiskey trade. And so some of these Blackfoot camps were able to maintain some order within their camps. But also, as we know, those uh, once that moved into the British possessions, a lot of things changed. So this liquor trade had a huge effect on the Blackfoot people, particularly between 1865 and 1869. So from that time in Fort Benton, with the whiskey trade in Fort Benton, uh, the Blackfoot people were truly uh, suffering from this effect of the liquor trade. So if we look at the next image, yeah, as I mentioned, a lot of the Blackfoot tribes started to trade with the Hudson Bay Company in Fort Edmonton and Rocky Mountain House by this time. They didn't want to uh, uh, go down south. But this changed. So actually, so in the hopes of improving the trade for the Northwest Fur Company, this Ripplinger, he decided to build a new post farther north down the Marias River at this place called Red Cooley. So this was pretty close to the British border as they would call it, the traders. So, but his decision to build a new post closer to the British border, this was a harbinger of things to come. Because now they were basically as far north of the United States border as you can get, right? Basically almost going into present day Canada. And then it was because of them moving this far, far away from the Fort Benton, that a lot of traders actually started to move north as well. And eventually, they moved into their British possessions. And that's what we'll be talking about in the part three, is the Whoopup whiskey trade, as it became known as. And then this uh, Whoopup whiskey trade was extremely detrimental to the Blackfoot, to the Siksikaitsitipi, to be. because, you know, things were as bad as they were in the United States territories of the Blackfoot. Because of Fort Benton, once they moved into the British possessions and it was able to get to all the Blackfoot camps and Blackfoot tribes, then we had suffering on an untold scale. But we'll talk about that in a lot of the winter count records um, in the part three to come. So we could, uh, so with that, I'll leave that with you. And we'll I just wanna take a look at a couple of books for those of you who wanted to study this more and get a little bit more information. There are uh, a few books out there that you could take a look at. Uh, one of them is uh, Indians in the Fur Trade. That's with the Hudson Bay Company and Northwest Company Trade. And if you want to, the next one, with a good reading would be Firewater by Hugh Dempsey. He talks a lot about the whiskey whoop-up trade from Fort Benton, um, but mostly in the Alberta, the whoop-up trade. And then the other book that you could take a look at is uh, by Jerry, uh, a book on Jerry Potts, who was... Uh, an eyewitness to all of these events in this book called Bear Child. Now, if you want to look at the other book at the Winter Counts and those uh, recorded by the Blackfoot would be this one, the Blackfoot History, the, the Winter Counts. So with that, I'll let you go and we'll talk about part three in the month, in the weeks to come. But in the meantime, remember COVID's still out there. Be safe and uh, be good to each other. And I'll see you next week. Gator Matsin.